Somebody say that my worship is for real. I'm not. <laughs> William said, I ain't playing with this thing. I'm, I don't have time to do it for you. Tell your neighbor, I do this in my car. You should see me on 59 sometime. They get on my nerve at work. I go in the bathroom and I shout. Some of y'all do it in the kitchen at home while you're washing dishes before you know it. Tears are coming down your eyes when you think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for you. Been through too much. Been through too much. Been through too much. Not holding any grudges. I've been through too much. I, I'm not going to let you ruin my next year and it ain't even started yet. I've been through too much. I've had enough had enough New Year's that didn't go my way. I've had enough problems. I had enough sorrow. I had enough pain. This is my year of elevation. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. The word of the Lord says, but if anyone has caused sadness, he has not saddened me alone, but to some extent, not to exaggerate, he has saddened all of us as well. The punishment on such an individual by the majority is enough for him so that now instead, you should rather forgive and comfort the person who hurt you. This will keep him from being overwhelmed by excessive grief to the point of despair. You mean to tell me when somebody hurts me, I should care how they feel? For this reason, also I wrote to you to test to see if you are obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone for anything, I also forgive him. For indeed, which I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did so for you in the presence of Christ. So that we may not be exploited by the devil. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. I want to talk on this subject. There's been a change of plans. Just touch your neighbor on the way down to the seat and just say, I'll explain it to you later, but there's been a change. Of plans hallelujah to the Lord church there is something intoxicating about new things the Bible even supports the idea of forgetting those things which are behind I press toward the mark for the upward, the newer call. Old things have passed away. And all things become what? New. This is that time of year. People are, are exchanging three things in this season. They're exchanging clothes, cars, and circles. You're in your closet right now figuring out what's not going into the new year. And you're getting rid of old stuff and, and you're giving it away making room for what? New things. If you watch TV right now, there's all kind of year-end sales. Trade your car in. Give us your car in. We'll give you a newer model and we won't raise your, 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 your payment because it, there's an exchange. All, all things are becoming new. And some of you have already made up in your mind that you're not going into 2018 with the same circle. You've already made up your mind. You're not, you, these, these people who have drained you year after year after year, you, you've made up in your mind. I'm not, I'm not even going to call them. If they don't call me, I don't mind if I don't hear from them because I'm going into the new year uh, with, with new things. But I, I'm amazed, and, and everybody's going to make New Year's resolutions. They're going to get rid of cars and clothes and circles, and some of, you, of us even going to say we're going to lose weight. Uh, it, we'll, we'll say it. We're going to lose weight. Just a matter of fact, by a show of hand, how many of y'all said you're going to lose weight in the, in the new year? I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how many people have decided to lose weight but won't lay aside every weight uh, that, that so easily doth beset us. And so 
many of you uh, will jeopardize uh, your future because you itemize your pain. Uh, most people keep a record of wrong. And, and Paul specifically says in 1 Corinthians that love keeps no record of wrong. In other words, uh, the idea that you can love somebody and keep a list of hurt is an oxymoron at best. Uh, that, that to love a person is to forget how they hurt you. I know this is not going to be a popular sermon, but I, I, I'm, I'm showing you how to make sure that 2018 is a good year because let me tell you, you're not ready for next year until you can forgive the person who hurt you this year. Uh, you, you cannot take any old anxiety, any old anger, any old pain into the new year because if you take old hurt into a new year, you will turn the new year into your last year. Uh, and so whenever we refuse to let go of pain, uh, we give the people who hurt us a double victory. Uh, when, when we refuse to forgive, we give them a double victory. We give them a, the first victory when they hurt us and the second victory when we allow what they did to hinder us. See, somebody can hurt you without hindering you. Oh, God, this ain't going to be a popular sermon, but it's going to help you. What we've got to learn in this new year is, is how do I let somebody offend me without hindering me? And, and how, do I, how do I let them go how do I let the pain go? How do I let the hurt go and still continue to move about my life? And how do I get to the place where I stop exaggerating my pain? And, and, and how do I get over uh, this hump, this hurdle that I've been dealing with in my life? And I looked it up. The Latin word uh, for, for emotion is actually disturbance. And so whenever you have a person who is extremely emotional, they are apt, actually is, 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 Disturbed. I don't want to, I'm trying to say it without saying it. Uh, whenever you have a person who's overly emotional, uh, you actually have a person who's actually overly disturbed. And, and the inability, listen to this, the inability to forgive is an emotion that represents an amplified thought pattern that has morphed into a disturbance. In other words, anything that makes you angry is something that you keep thinking about over and over and over again. And, and most of us can never move forward because most people never live in the present. They either live in the past or in the future. And let me tell you, in order for a grudge to continue to stay in your life, it needs time. And you cannot heal time with time. Uh, you have to leave time in order to heal time. I'm, I'm explaining this all in a minute. In, in other words, whenever you're hurt, you have to leave where your mind is and put yourself in a different position other than where your thoughts are because whenever you stay with your hurt, your hurt will stay with you. God, help me in this church today. Somebody just touch your name and say, it's going to be a hard one today. It's going to be a hard one. Listen, the key to psychological freedom is to decide that in spite of what the present moment presents, you have to work with it like you chose it. No matter whoever hurts you, you got to work with it like you picked it. You got to, whatever they say to you, you got to say to yourself, well, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. So if they left me, they were supposed to leave me. If they lied on me, then that lie was supposed to unearth some truth. If, if they left me out there to dry, then God must wanted me dry. If they left me out there by myself, then God wanted me to have a season of isolation. The next time you get hurt, I want you to make up in your mind. I don't know what it is, but you got to work with it like you picked it. Slap your name and say, work with it like you picked it. If you come across a bad man, work with it like you picked it. If you come across a bad woman, work with it like you picked it. Even after you find out that they are not for you, you got to work with it like you picked it because God has something in that crisis that is going to take you to the next level. I wish I had somebody in this church today. I'm going to get through this thing because most of us have got to stop living in the past. Touch three people and say, stop living in the past. I want to say something to you right now that you might not understand, but you'll get it after I've finished. Nothing ever happened in the past. Oh, God, help me in this place. Nothing ever happened in your past. Can I say it for the third time? Nothing ever happened in your past. When it happened, it was the present. And nothing will ever happen in your future because by the time it happens, it'll still be now. Y'all not here with me today. There is only one time in your life it is now. That's why the Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now is the time that when they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Somebody slap your neighbor and say, you got to learn how to live now. 
you got to stop hoping for a man and just be glad that you don't have one because God is actually trying to do something in your now that will help you in your tomorrow. I wish I had a church in this place today. Stop always looking forward to getting married and start shouting about the fact that you don't have marital problems. Stop always looking forward to the next day and just say, this is the day that the Lord has made and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I want some of y'all to get out of your future and definitely climb out of your past and just start shouting and thanking God for now. I used to be sick, but now I'm happy. I, I, I used to be failing, but now I'm successful. And, and if you can get out of your past and stop hoping for your future, you can be happy today. That's why the Bible says he is a very present help in the time of a storm. Everybody's always looking for tomorrow, and the best time you'll ever have is... That's why everybody, the devil always wants you looking behind you. God says, press toward the mark, and you're always looking behind you. The mark is never where you left. You can't leave your head in a relationship that is over because whenever you are focused on a relationship that's over, you're over. If you leave your mind with the person that left, then that means you have given them the double victory of being able to control you when they don't contribute to you. And why in the world are you letting somebody control you that don't pay your bills? Why are you allowing somebody to control you that said they didn't like you? Why are you allowing somebody to control you that left you? If they went out from you, they must not have never been with you. Some of the hurt that you have is actually a blessing and not a curse. Some of the people you're trying to hold on to didn't want you and you want them. And now you have a false sense of reality thinking that because they don't want you that you are worthless. But what you must understand is that they were worthless. <laughs> Not worthless as a person, but worthless as it relates to your purpose. They got you to a certain place, shaped your mind for a certain process, and once they were done, you got to let them go. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm not taking old people into a new year. The Lord says, press toward the mark. I wish I had somebody in here that would tell the devil, I've got to change the plans. All of my life, I've been working off of grudges and hurt, and all of my life, I've, I've, even, been, I've even been successful using pain to push me, but, but I'm going to change my motivation strategy. I, I don't need pain to motivate me. I need purpose to motivate me. I used to work to try to get even with people who are not, who are not there for me, and I wanted to show my father that I could succeed. Now I don't have to show him. I just got to show me. Does anybody who uses pain as an indication of progress will also be subjugated to defaulting back to pain because most people are addicted to what got them there. And so when you use pain to get you there, you have to have pain to survive there because you can never use an, a different mode of transportation to a place because when you use complaining to get to the promised land, you complain once you get to the promised land because the subconscious tells you that your complaining is what got you there. So when you read this chapter, and I'm almost done because I, I got to preach three times a day. When, when you read this chapter, it is exceedingly difficult to read. I bet when I was reading it, some of y'all was like, what is Paul saying? If you do this and you do that, yet in parentheses, if you care, if you don't believe, it's, it's so convoluted, it's so confusing, and, and, and even the sections where, where, where subject matters remain, it is fairly inconsistent and oxymoronical, and it is frustrating at best, and there's interruptions of tones and change, and there's a frustration in the syntax and in the grammar. And the reason why I believe it is that way because Hurt is the same way. Hurt is so confusing. Most people in here today, whatever hurts you, you can't even remember the details about it. All you know is who did it, but you don't know what they did. If you ask them what happened, I don't remember, but I just know it was bad. If you ever ask most people what happened, they can't give you the details. Why? Because hurt is, is convoluted it, it, and, and it's subjective. In other words, most of the things that hurt you are from your perspective. And, and you think that everybody did this and everybody did that. And that, that's why when Paul comes to this section of the scripture, if you recognize this, he does two things. He doesn't say what the man did and he doesn't say who the man is because God wants us to know as the Holy Spirit in, in, in invited him to write this scripture and inspired this scripture he wanted us to know that no matter what's going on in your life who did it ain't important and what they did ain't important and the reason why most people can't move on is because they're always on who did it and what happened who did it and what happened girl let me tell you what she did and she did it on purpose 
and she did it on purpose. How you know? Because I can just tell. Do you understand how crazy the masses are? How you know? Because I can tell. Tell what? So he's angry, he's hurt, but he doesn't mention the person, nor does he say what the person did. And this is why most of us can't move along, because we're not happy until everybody knows who hurt us. When somebody hurts you, you got to tell everybody. Some of y'all get on social media and make posts and, and let me tell you what he did. You are not hurt. You are immature. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. It takes a mature person to be hurt and care about the person who hurts you. Love covers a multitude of sin. See, the problem with most of us is that we are not in love. We are in lust, which is why we expose them when they hurt us. I'm so tired of seeing people break up and then get on the internet and tell everybody, oh, let me tell you about the baby they had. Let me tell you about what they did. You're not hurt. You're immature. Tell your neighbor, point number one, shut up. Hurt in silence. Hush your mouth. It is not anybody's business what your husband did to you. It is not anybody's business what your girlfriend did to you. You the one laid up with him. Shut up. How you going to date in private and then expose in public? You don't want nobody in your business and then go put them in it. Oh, I came for you. I'm coming for you. You didn't send for me, but I'm coming. Well, that ain't point number one. I got ahead of myself. I, didn't, I, I just got angry just looking at some of y'all just like. Hmm. And I'm glad we don't know what he did. But some theologians say, if you really study the context and culture, the syntax grammatically, what actually happened is this man who hurt Paul did one of two things. Either he slept with Paul's stepmother, which means he was sleeping with Paul's mama's wa daddy's wife at the same time she was married to Paul's daddy. Or this was the same God that had, had created the rebellion and said that Paul was a fake apostle. But nonetheless, whatever he did, he offended Paul. And the problem is, is the church is mad at a man that hurt Paul. He ain't did nothing to them. And I guarantee you that some of y'all, the person you mad at ain't did nothing to. He, he, he mad, he mad. And see, the, you're not mad at your husband. You mad at the person that hurt you before you met your husband. And since you don't have the courage to confront the person who hurt you, you confront the person that's with you. The reason why most of us can't work out our issues is because we're working out old issues with current people. I didn't hurt you. You were insecure when I met you. I did not make you this way. I did not make you this way. Truth be told, you were worse than this when I met you. I've actually helped you. Oh, y'all don't want to say amen. If you can't say amen, just say ouch up in this place today. So Paul says to the people, and this is something y'all going to have to do if you want 2018 to be successful. He says, I want you to reach out to the person who hurt me I want you to care more about his feelings than ours. Now, if you ain't ready for 2018, if you are not ready to forgive the people who hurt you in 2017, and the word says, stop exaggerating. It wasn't that bad. They lied to me. So you a liar too. What is the problem? It just, it just, I, listen, I have zero tolerance. I'm a realist. People around here making you pay for lying. And the only difference between them is you ain't caught them in their lie yet. You better than me because you caught me? You better than me because you caught me? Hold on a little while because your, your, your truth is going to find you out too. Walking around here with your holy self talking about, I can't believe they were unfair to me, unfaithful to me. You are out of your mind. Yeah. 
He said, yeah, it's quiet as a church mouse in here, peeing on cotton. He said, he said, I want you to care about the person who hurts you. Lest he be too emotional and lose his faith, I want you to reach out to the person who hurt you. See, here's the problem with most people. We think the person who hurt us ought to come to us. Paul says, no, you have to reach out to the person who hurt you. And this is why you never get to the next level because you're sitting there waiting on an apology and it ain't coming. And when it do come, it ain't going to come in the form you want it. Touch your name and say, don't wait, reach. Stop waiting on somebody to call you and tell you why they hurt you. You go out there and say, listen, we need to talk. I need to know why you did this to me because I didn't deserve it. I didn't do anything to you. I was nothing but good to you. I need to know why you hurt me. They're not coming. You've got to reach out. Ooh, Lord, this ain't, this is not what I'm preaching tonight. I'm getting y'all together tonight. We're going to shout tonight, but I'm just saying. The church had punished this man. They wouldn't let him do nothing. They wouldn't let him on the deacon board, wouldn't let him in the choir, wouldn't let him be an usher because he messed up. Never mind that all the people who don't want him on the board messed up too. I, I, can, I can't stand to see people be in love for years and years and years and then get hurt and just start exposing folk. Just start telling all your business. Would you shut up, please? All your business ain't none of ours. I love you too. <laughs> this is like, we, we just live in such an immature society. Just posting stuff on the internet. Let me tell you what, shut up. You about to mess up your money. The more you focus on the past, the more you make a self out of it. Most of us don't recognize that we have made our hurt a golden image and we bow to it every morning. You have made your hurt an idol God and you worship it. Let me tell you what an attitude is. An attitude is nothing more than a silent argument that a person has to draw you into a conversation that they can control. That's why people walk around with attitudes all day. They walk around one because they want you to say what's wrong so they can give you a whole synopsis on a conversation that they had in their head that you've never been invited to. So people walk around with attitudes all day long to draw you into a moment that they can control. That's why you got to learn to ignore attitudes. Let them have one. Walk right past me. Good morning. I wish you would. I wish I would sit here and have a conversation that I'm going to lose anyway. I wish I would sit up here and stoop down and ask you what's wrong. I've asked you what's wrong for the last five weeks. You don't want to tell me? You're going to suffer by yourself until you suffer to the point where you die because I refuse to die with you. Just walking around the house. What's wrong with you? Nothing. All they want you to do is say, what's wrong? And then they want to tell you this whole conversation that they've had in their head that they did not invite you to. You will never win that conversation because you were not invited. You got to learn to ignore attitudes for however long it takes. And fellas, for some of you, that means I'm trying to, this is, I'm trying to keep it PG up in here, but fellas, you know what I'm saying? She gonna have attitude, you gonna have to be good. Is this the slow class or y'all got what I'm saying? Do I need the chalkboard? Do I need the smart board or y'all got what I'm saying? Man up. You cannot find forgiveness in the past. It is not there. When people are always telling me I'm searching for my purpose in life, I know they live in the past because that's where they're looking for purpose. Or they're always hoping for the future, which is why they can never find themselves because they are never in the past or the future. They are always now. 
That's why God says to Abraham, he says, when Pharaoh gives you any lip, tell them I am that I am. Notice that God is always a very present help. Notice that God never says he was or that he will be. Anytime he refers to himself, he is because he never began and he began before the beginning began. He always is, which is why God is the propitiation of sin because he is the only human that always is. That's why you and I can't be Jesus because we were and are and will be, but he is. You understand what I'm telling you? He is. He always is. That's why people say, well, Jesus, he was 2,000 years old. Not true because the Bible lets us know in the beginning that, that, that he was there. In the beginning was the word. He was there. He, he never began. Only he only just transmorphed himself into human flesh so that those of us who are flesh might be the righteousness of God. But he was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. He was and is and is to come, encompassing all time frames simultaneously that God is in the future, the past, and the present all at the same time. Because you cannot survive when the past is your supper. The past cannot survive in your presence. It can only survive in your absence, which is why most people always leave the moment and go back to what happened because it's the only place they can find purpose. Lord, help me in this cold church today. It's, it's the parody of the prodigal son. Remember, the prodigal son was doing all right in his father's house. Then he went to the future. I want my inheritance. Look at how he loses his present going after his future. He goes after his future prematurely, and now he's eating in hall pens. Because to get to your future prematurely is to revert back to your past. He cannot eat the slop of the future, nor can he eat the bread of the past because he not, he's not able to stay in either lane, and he's comparing himself to his brother. And now what was once his, he's saying, how many of my father's servants have bread to eat, and how many of them have meat to eat? And here I am in the hog pen. You didn't have to be in the hog pen if you would have stayed in your present, but because you wanted your future prematurely, now you're, you've spent all you had in the riders living, and whenever you eat your dinner in the morning, you have nothing to eat when the night comes. <laughs> he, he's, he's in the future, and here's the problem. He's in the future with a past mentality. So you will mess up your tomorrow because you haven't fixed your head. So here he is, wanting money that he hasn't even a strategy for. So he spends it on prostitutes, right his living. Why? Because he asked God for something he wasn't prepared to handle. You asking God for 2018, why would God give you a great next year if you don't have a good mindset going into the new year? This is why I'm preaching this sermon because everybody always gives up on the previous year, hoping for the clock to strike 12, thinking that when, 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 the, when the clock strikes 12, then everything is just going to be magical. The only thing you got to remember is you taking you with you. You got to stop relying on 2018 and stop relying on 2019 and you got to rely on you. Yeah. Anger is okay. You do know that God says you can be angry and sin not. But the problem is, is that anger should never be vindictive. It should all be, always be redemptive. That the only person you should ever be angry at is the person you want to redeem. If the person is not worth keeping, they are not worth getting mad with. Do me a favor, touch your name and say, if you ain't gonna keep them, don't get mad. I'm not getting ready to be mad at somebody I ain't keeping. I'm not about to use my mind for somebody I'm getting rid of. Don't be mad, just get rid of them. Are y'all listening to me? No sense of getting mad, just get rid of them. But why are you, why are you making me miserable? Why do I have to walk around and be subjugated to your immaturity and the fact that you cannot get over it? I told you I did it. I admitted that I did it. Now either it is your opportunity to get over it or leave me alone. Let me tell y'all something. Most of the people you hurt don't have the courage to leave you. They're waiting on you to leave them. 
And how many times do we forgive? 70 times 7. What does that mean? He says, the Bible says that if somebody hurts you seven days in a row, then he says you need to forgive them seven days in a row. There is never a hurt that God says you should not forgive. But Reverend, you don't understand how bad it was. I might not understand how bad the hurt was, but I do know how perfect the cross was. Anger caused Cain to kill Abel. Anger always turns into something else. Oh, God, help me in this church today. Cain got mad because Abel took us a good sacrifice to the Lord, and instead of him adjusting his offering, he killed his brother. That's what most people do. Instead of adjusting, they try to kill the person they're jealous of. You could have simply just adjusted your offering and then God would have accepted that. You kill the offerer instead of doing something with your offering. I'm preaching. You know how I know I'm preaching? Because it sounds like we're in a Presbyterian church right now. Y'all ain't got, y'all ain't said a word. That's how I know I'm getting down. I'm about to change the name of the church to the Lighthouse Presbyterian on the Rock Catholic Assemblies. Because y'all sitting out there ain't said nothing call yourself charismatic and, and non-denominational. This quiet? <laughs> Matter of fact, let's take communion right now. I will. Moses got mad and struck that rock. He let anger keep him out of his promised land. You remember Haman came and, and everybody had bowed except for Mordecai. And he was mad that Mordecai didn't bow to him, and then he plotted to get Mordecai killed. This is what most people do when they get angry. 10,000 people bow, one, one, one didn't. And you're going to focus on the one who didn't bow instead of the 10,000 who did, because anger always causes you to focus on what doesn't matter. Haven't you noticed how many people love you? How, haven't you noticed how many people want to help you? Haven't you noticed how many people God has sent in your life and the only person you can think about every day is the one that don't support you? As many good memories and moments as you and your husband had and as many good days you've had, you mean to tell me the only day you can remember is the day he hurt you? You mean to tell me one bad day is worth five good years? I'm all up in your face and I don't care. Y'all done been to Mexico, you done got a new house, you got new cars, you got children together, and you mad about the one day. And where y'all get this idea that, that y'all gonna be married all these years and ain't nothing gonna happen? Well, yeah, who told you that? How the world you think you're going to be married to, to somebody 30 years and they ain't, going, they ain't going to like nobody but you? You ain't that fine. They going to like somebody. Oh, yeah, I'm going to keep it real because y'all playing with me up in here. You think they ain't going to be attracted to nobody. You don't think nobody going to come across them. They're going to say, this is the wife I got and this is the wife God want me to have. You don't think that's never going to happen? You that bad. You ain't cooked all year. Where do you think you deserve that? Bro, you ain't had a job all year. You think she ain't going to meet one dude? You think you all there. You think she ain't going to leave you. Let me tell you something. The right brother come at the right time when her mindset is in the right place. I don't care. She'll choose ugly over fine. Oh, Lord, don't make, don't, don't, make, don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. You be looking. His belly be all out here. He'll have four legs and dragging around, but he'll rub her hair and run some bath water. You be out here fine and sick. Talking about where she gonna go. All right, keep playing. You'll find out. Matter of fact, there's a couple of brothers been over your house this week that'll take that job. Stop letting people tell you, ain't nobody gonna want you but me. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. Touch your name and say, that's a lie. Because if I put myself back on the market, I'll be sold in a few hours. Don't you play with me. It ain't that don't nobody want me. It's that I don't want them. <laughs> Slap your name and say, I'm a good catch. I'm a good catch.
Don't nobody want me. You crazy. I turn this swag back on, it's all gonna happen. You understand? I done turned it off. You better leave me where I'm at. Touch your neighbor and say, instead of paying attention, who didn't bow? Pay attention to who did. Jesus, on the other hand, is beaten. Crown of thorns put on his head. 39 lacerations to his back. And yet he never says a word. Which means you don't have to speak every time somebody hurts you. Nick, I want you to type that in my notes because I want to say that again in the second service. You don't have to say something every time. They pulled the hair from his face, he never said anything. They put a crown of thorns on his head, he never said anything. They, they beat him with a cat of nine tails on his back, he never says anything. You don't have to say something every time somebody hurts you. Sometimes you must suffer in silence. Because the Bible says in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. You will have trouble. You will be left. Your friends will mock you. They will turn their back on you. And it is all a part of the plan. If I'm helping you, put your hands together and praise God in this place. Jesus never says a word. And when he does finally open his mouth, Eli, Eli, Labanasani, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, forgive them for they know not who they're doing it to. That, that's the real exegesis of the words. They knew what they were doing. They just didn't know who they were doing it. Touch your neighbor. If the devil knew how much anointing I'd have, he'd leave me alone. If those folk at the job knew that I was getting ready to be the boss, they'd be nice. See, the problem is, is people don't understand who you're getting ready to be. They're treating you based on who you are. Give your neighbor high five and say, you better quit tripping because you don't know what I'm about to become. God has promised me the kingdom. He has promised me the keys to the kingdom. Pilate says, boy, you, do you know that I got the power to crucify you or let you go in my hand? Jesus looks at him and finally opens his mouth and said, man, you ain't got no power except the power that my father gave to you. Can I help you? The only power people have over you is the power. The only power that they have over you is the power you have given them. In 2018, you got to take your power. You got to take your power back. You got to stop letting people mess up your week. You got to take your power back. You have raised your children. The fact that they didn't listen doesn't mean you're a bad parent. You got to take your power back. The fact that you got a divorce doesn't mean you're not a good woman. It means that it's time for you to take your power back. So what, you lost your job. You were never meant to work for anybody anyway. You gotta learn to take the power back. You're walking around depressed every day because of how somebody treats you. Why? If you treat yourself better, you wouldn't recognize how bad they're treating you. 
The problem is, is most of you are waiting on somebody else to make you happy, and they don't have the ability to do it because happiness is an inside job, and you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. As a matter of fact, I want you to spend the next eight seconds speaking well of yourself. Say, self, you are something else. You are going to the next level, self. You are an entrepreneur, self. You are a good mother, self. You are a good father, self. You have been the best wife you could be, self. Do I have anybody who will start to encourage yourself? If you've been a good mother, go on and shout. If you've been a good father, go ahead and shout. If you've been a good husband, go ahead and shout. If you've been a good wife, shout. If you've been a good employee, shout. You got to learn to encourage yourself. Come on, give yourself some praise and just thank God that as crazy as you are, you haven't messed up the whole thing yet. Watch what, listen to what Paul says. Y'all got three minutes. Paul says, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. He says, this is why I want you to do it, to protect the one who offended you from losing his faith. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul. Hold on, bro. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that you're saying that God says that I have to initiate the forgiveness with the person who offended me so that he won't have grief? Did you hear what I just said? You have to forgive the person who hurt you so that they don't hurt. That means you have to care more about the person who didn't care about you. Okay. Some, so ain't nobody here like, man, this crazy. Anybody here other than me like, Lord, you, what is you? Did you make this one when you was unconscious? That's what the Bible says. Paul says, away with the ministry of they got what they deserved. This is what most people think, that whenever they do something wrong to you and something bad happens to them, they think that's God repaying them for what they did to you. So they say, well, he got what he deserved. You know what I've asked myself? Why is it that when people hurt you, they should get what they deserve? But when you are disobedient to God, you should get grace. <laughs> when somebody crosses you, they get what they deserve. When you cross God, Lord, just if you let me out this time. Whoever prayed that prayer, Lord, if you just... <clears throat> Lord, if you just, if you just this time, I promise I won't ever. I ain't never kept that promise. You got to get the ministry of they got what they deserved out of it. It'd be like, it'd be like you arguing with your husband. Did he go around the bed and hit his foot on the toe? See, you got what you deserve. God, God don't like ugly. <clears throat> All the time. <laughs> I'm praying for you, Cindy. Joe said, all the time, Reb, all the time. She said, pray for me, Reb. You know you've been in church a long time, not Reverend Reb. You know it? Anybody who call him Reb? She said, you can't want the person that hurt you to be hurt. You want the person who hurt you to be helped. That's the way you're ready for a new year. There's been a change of plans. I'm going to change the way I see trouble. I'm going to change the way I see hurt. I'm going to change the way I respond to pain. I actually want the person who hurt me to be helped because if they're not helped, they're going to hurt somebody else. Paul says, take them back. And I don't know who this is. If we're in here right now, I might be talking to a woman. God says, take them back. Where are you going, Bridget? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, she got to go. The sermon almost over. I just, she got to go get the room set up. I'm just messing with you. Go ahead on now. Go ahead on now. 
God says, take them back. Take her back. Your sister, take her back. Your best friend, the one that hurt you, take them back. I ain't never had this many sermons preached in the sanctuary all in one. Everybody preaching today. I'm going to get all of y'all a license before this sermon over with. Take them back. But they cheated on me. You've been hiding money. Take them back. Don't fix your hair now. It wasn't, it wasn't messed up earlier. The devil has tricked us into thinking that cheating on us, on each other, is the worst thing that can happen in a relationship, and I can give you 15 things worse. We first sin in our mind, then we sin in our body. One of the things my wife and I try to make a practice of is we talk about all of the hard stuff. We talk about all of the hard stuff, all the stuff that people act like ain't never going to happen in life. We talk about all the hard stuff, and sometimes we be crying talking to each other. I done threatened her life. But I ain't going nowhere. I ain't never going to leave her. I'm going to tell you that right now. I told her if she tried to leave me, and I said, if a man come to you and say, what's your phone number? I said, give it to him. Your bank account. And then, and then after you give him that number, tell him you got two numbers, then give him my bank account. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> but we coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Man come and try to get my wife. I'm like, are you sure you can take care of both of us? Because I like some expensive stuff, brother. <laughs> I got to have a car, too. She can't be around here driving nothing new, and I ain't got nothing new. I ain't leaving that girl. C.S. Lewis said, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we got to practice it. Everybody want to talk about forgiveness and how much the Lord forgave, and it was a good sermon until you had to preach it. How many of y'all ever had to forgive? I'm talking about really forgive. How, who will be honest and say it's a hard thing to do? <laughs> you know why it's hard? Because you're forgiven like you're innocent. The only way forgiving is hard is when you approach it like you ain't done nothing wrong ever. Forgiving is easy when you recognize how many times you've been forgiven. You got to stop going into it like you haven't done anything. You got to start thinking about, look at all the stuff God has forgiven me for. At least I could do is extend grace to somebody else. Come on, church. You're not perfect. You haven't done anything right, everything right. I'm not saying I didn't mean anything. You haven't done any, everything right. You, you haven't crossed all of your T's and dotted all of your I's. You, you got to stop entering this thing like you haven't done anything wrong. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have come short, and the fact that you are still here today is enough for you to give it. Why? Because God can't forgive you until you forgive them. Your forgiveness is tied into your forgiveness. You got to let them go. And I didn't want you to go into the next year with all of this hurt and pain because it's over. If you're going to hurt in 2018, hurt over the stuff that happened in 2018, not the stuff that happened in 2015. And let me tell you this last thing, and we're going to stand and go home. This is what he says. This is why you have to do it, so that no advantage would be given to the devil. Whenever we don't forgive, we give the devil an advantage over our life. And that's why he keeps wearing you out. Not that you're not a prayer warrior, not you fasting, but you won't forgive. And when you won't forgive, you give the devil advantage in your life and you will lose daily to an enemy who has already been defeated. Where do we receive forgiveness at? At the cross. Okay. Do you all remember when Jesus was on his way to the cross? And the devil started using Peter. And Peter tried to get in the way of the cross. 
And he basically was saying, Jesus, I'll die for you. You don't have to do this. I'll die for you. What does Jesus say to Peter in the book of Matthew? Satan, get behind me. Why does he call him Satan? Because he's getting in the way of forgiveness. Anybody in your life who's telling you that you don't have to forgive is a devil. Anybody in your life who encourages your anger is a devil in your life. Anybody who tells you had a right to be mad, and if I was you, I would have did, they're a devil. Pastor, that was my mama. Anybody who encourages your anger and tells you not to forgive is a devil in your life. And you got to do what Jesus told Peter. It don't mean they can't preach Pentecost. Don't mean you can't restore the brethren. But at that moment, and when that doesn't work, he starts to use another one. Because now, one man tries to keep him from the cross. Another man kisses him from the cross. Judas turns him over. You don't have to do nothing to him. He, he hung himself. But the two people that we talk about in the story of salvation that he deals with is people who kept try to keep him from the cross. That's why he calls Judas friend because his betrayal got him to the place of forgiveness. I want to know, are you willing to have a whole nother miserable year because of unforgiveness? I, 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 I don't do a lot of things well, but I let stuff go real good. I think that, and this is the honest truth, and my wife will tell you, I think the longest I ever been mad at something was maybe a day or two. We have never, in 10 years of relationship, went mad at each other all week, all month. We don't, it's just, you got to go. You know, most, most couples, when they get mad at each other, they go sleep in different rooms in the house. Or you go to your mama house. Let me say to all of the mamas in here, stop letting your daughter come to your house when she's mad at her husband. Send her butt back home. <clears throat> You're making it too easy for her. Send her home. If he ain't beating on her and all that, they ain't doing no arguing, send her home. Say, go home and shut up. Go home and work it out. Always running. Some people are always running. Ten years of marriage, my wife and I, you know, most couples sleeping. We ain't never, one time she slept in another bed, but I, I got up and went there and slept in there with her. She, she left me one time and she said, you get on my nerve and, and I don't know if I want to do this no more. She grabbed the covers off the bed and went up to the guest room and I went right behind and laid down. It's the truth, didn't I, baby? I came right up there with her. I said, you ain't, girl, please. <clears throat> We're going to go to sleep mad, but you ain't finna sleep in no another room. The idle mind is a devil workshop. Whatever you're going to think about, you're going to think about it with me sitting here. You ain't going to go upstairs and get a gun and then come back downstairs and kill me. You gonna, if you get in this bed and move, I'm going to feel you. Sit down, sister, now. You better lay down. Bob, stay, stand your ground. This is Texas. Now sit down. We, we don't, we never stormed out of the house and left and all that. I'm not trying to tell you to be like us. I'm just telling you that we have these hard conversations so that when hard stuff happens, we already know what we're going to do and how we're going to react and all that kind of stuff. And we're not perfect. We fight like everybody else. But I, we fight fair. That's one thing I can say about us. We fight fair. Like, my wife, I don't call her out of her name. She don't call me out of my name. I've yet to, 10 years, I've never called her anything but Felicia. Never called her out of her name. Never put my hands on her. I wanted to one time. I, I, I did. I had, um, let me tell you what happened. <clears throat> we, were, we, was, we was outside one day, uh, outside the house, and we got to arguing, and, and Sister Henderson said something slick, boy, and I went out to grab her and hit my arm on a nail on the side of a wall and scraped my arm, and the blood came down. See, there you go with that spirit of, that's that spirit in you. That's that spirit in you talking about, that's what you get. I just preached. Where was you at? See? See how y'all think that something happened? That wasn't the Lord, that was my dumb self. 
I reached out to go grab and, and, and scrape my arm up. I said, well, <laughs> that didn't work. And here's the crazy part. This is how you know she loved me. After I did it, then she went in the house and got me some Band-Aids and wiped the blood off. Ain't that crazy? <laughs> but we'd have made it this long, this far, never hit each other, never called each other out of name, never left the house, never did none of that stuff. Now, I don't know what's going to happen not tomorrow. I'm just telling you what ain't happened yet. See, I, done, I said this and then something happened. Then y'all be like, Rev said he'd never do that. I didn't say that. I said it hadn't happened. <laughs> but do you know that if you visit your future psychologically, you can be ready for it when you arrive? That you have to visit trouble so you can be ready for it. I just wanted to tell you today, you got to change your plans. You got to change the way you handle conflict and you got to stop giving all of your time to anger because anger cannot survive in your presence. It can only survive in your absence. Stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, sir. I'm going to pray for you because I know that unforgiveness is a hard, 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 hard stronghold that the devil has on us as a people. If you want me to pray that God will give you the spirit of forgiveness, raise your hand. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Is it okay? Okay. I'm going to pray for you. Do me a favor for the sake of time, and I don't want to cause a traffic jam at the next service. Would you just hold your neighbor's hand? I'm going to pray for you. A wonderful job. Hey, come on up here. Come on. Solidarity. We'll just... We're going to pray for you together. You're looking at two people. We've, we've come over many dangers, toys and snares. And both of our lives before we met each other were rocky. I mean, we didn't, we didn't meet each other perfectly. We met each other bruised and battered. And we met each other with all kinds of insecurities. And when you don't heal yourself before you hook up with somebody else, you end up hurting the person you hook up with. So we had to get over all of that kind of stuff. It took us about five years. To be honest, it took us about five years to, to get to a place where the rocky places were kind of smoothing out and we didn't know where we were going to make it. And we threatened each other four or five times of divorce and we were going to leave each other and walk away from each other. But we recognized that what would it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soulmate? And sometimes you think you can get rid of something and find something else. Let me tell you, whatever you find going to be just as worse, if not worse than what you left. They may look better, but they're going to be more crazy. They have more money, but they'll have less time. You might not have the same problem, but you'll have another problem. So you, just, you just have to learn to love the one you're with. Just touch your name and say, learn to love the one you're with. And that also means learning to love yourself. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would shower the spirit of forgiveness in this house. That you would allow our hearts and our minds to coagulate around the concept, the principle of getting over and not staying in. Wise man stumbles, but he gets up again, God. I pray that you would get us up off of our proverbial spiritual knees and get us on our feet so that we can stand on solid ground, that we will build our house on Christ. On Christ, the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I pray that you give us the strength to forgive our fathers and our mothers and our siblings and our co-workers and our cousins and our, anybody who's hurt us, God. Pray that you, would, that you would simmer our temperatures and our tempers, that we would not be in near-death experiences because of traffic jams and, and all of the small things that bring us to being the ugliest of people. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts that in the most difficult circumstances,